Hello everyone, uh, my name is John Thine and it's Peter Haley. Um, we're both um, directors in the Forensic Services section at, um, at Vincent's. Today we've got uh, a session, a very short punchy session on business valuations. Um, we're, not, we're not going to the how do you do valuations, as I'm sure most of you will be well aware of sort of basics of, um, of business valuations. What we're talking about today are just some, some um, I guess, things that we've actually seen quite recently in, uh, in the valuations that we're doing. They're really coming to fore in quite a few of the valuations. Just get some technical difficulty here. There we go. That's Peter myself, and I believe the slides are being emailed out to you after the after the session to so have our contact details. What we're talking about today is is threefold. Um, firstly, can a business have negative value? Um, it's quite often um, assumed that a business it'll have its stock, it'll have its fit out, um, that it can never have zero value. It's always going to have a level of value if we're doing it before a uh, before debt position. Um, so can a business have negative value? Uh, the second one, is the business infrastructure a valuable asset or a sunk cost? You know, we, we see businesses that will spend half a million, million, two million dollars on fit out, um, therefore has it got two million dollars worth of an asset? Is that able to be sold? And finally, we wanted to recap on a few of the um, business drivers. There are three key business drivers. Um, what actually goes into those those key drivers clearly very very quickly uh, recapping on those and just to consider when you're looking at your own businesses that uh, for your clients um, what sort of things should you be addressing so firstly can a business have negative value well, we would just launch straight into a case study so this is um, which we had three of these at the same time. This is a, a franchise, we, a restaurant franchise we did up in Townsville. Um, it was a couple of years ago, it was just when Townsville um, fell off the, the cliff and the uh, trading performance of Townsville was really struggling as it still is now. So looking at a franchise, franchise restaurant, it had been trading for a short period of time and it still had eight and a half years left on the lease. The business assets were cash and a rental bond, about $50,000, stock of $10,000, uh, equipment fit out of 500,000, so it had recently done quite a substantial fit out. And it also um, paid $50,000 up front um, for the franchise rights, initial training and the like. Um, so all up, it actually had outlaid $610,000. So the question is, does the business have value? And that was our, our it was matrimonial and the scope of our engagement was to say, what is the value of that business, along with a few others? So initially we, we looked there, so the balance sheet says 610, and as a common approach that we do, um, the, the value is the higher of the capitalised earnings or the net tangible business assets. In this case here, we've got net tangible business assets of 610,000. On the face of it, should the value be $610,000? What here is the um, quite a cut down version of the profit and loss statement. So we can see um, 2015, 2016, how it's performing, and we're currently in the 2017 financial year. Um, the trading performance is around that sort of $1.2 million, um, but the, the actual trading performance itself um, in the um, 2000 and sort of the, the, the profit down the bottom of 2016 year was a loss of $172,000, and it was trading fairly similarly in the, the uh, 17 financial year up to for the first four months up to October. And 2015, of course, was only a couple of months. It was a startup year. So 16 is the only full year's trading we have here to analyse. And um, a part year, as John said, um, through to the four months for October 16 was at a similar level. And when you looked at it on a month by month basis, it was reasonably consistent. It was the only thing that concerned us. We also did a, a 12 month analysis from November 2015 through to October 2016. Um, and what that indicated was that although the actual trading performance was about the same, the sales were about the same, the actual overall profitability had reduced again, or the loss had increased to about 200, just a short $220,000. Um, and as I understand, part of that was a reduction in margins trying to actually win some clientele. Um, so at that point, they're losing in excess of $200,000 a year. So what is value? And I think it's, it's an opportune point to, um, to revisit that. What is value? 
these, you've got your traditional valuation um, uh, definition, um, the price negotiated in open unrestricted market between knowledgeable, willing, but not anxious buyer and seller acting at arm's length. It's a good theoretical definition, doesn't necessarily help us in how we actually do our, our valuations. So a secondary def definition is um, the amount of prudent investors prepared to pay in order to receive the expected future earnings or cash flow, having regard to the level of risk. What was the important things there is about profitability. It's about the future profitability. So we're looking forward and it's the level of risk associated with that business. Now, the thing is with both those definitions, they talk about you know, a potential purchaser. And on the face of it, when you go back to that profit and loss statement summary, with the business losing $220,000 a year, I suppose it's really a question is, you know, would there even be any potential purchases out there? So we're looking at future cash flows from this business. What future cash flows is likely to actually come from this business? So the owner's likely to receive, it's got its cash flow side. We know at the moment it's incurring a $220,000 loss and we've got an eight and a half year lease. So it's going to have to fund that loss into the future. Hopefully it'll be able to turn around. At this stage, we can't see any turnaround. In 2018, it's still not much better. Alternatively, we could try to terminate the business. If it terminates the business, we're breaking the lease. And as I understand in, in Townsville, landlords aren't coming uh, too kindly to that. Um, if we shut the business down, what do we have? You know, if we spent half a million dollars on fit out, what's that fit out worth? How do we approach this? And I hope you can read this, I hope it's not too small. We actually approached this on discounted cash flow type approach. So we actually said so in 2017, which was the year we were in at that stage, 2017 through to the end of the lease, based on the information that we know, what do we have? So we can see that our total income, cost of goods sold, gross profit, coming down to a net profit. And we did that on a um, uh, before depreciation type basis. So we tried to emulate um, cash flow as much as possible. Um, and there was no capex necessarily um, needed in this business. We then adopted a capitalization or discount rate. Now we used a 25% discount rate for a business like this, given the risk involved is fairly low. Um, now part of the rationale behind that was that these losses um, moving forward at the moment, they're real losses. So it's not we're, not, we're not having business risks that the business may deteriorate. We're pretty much in a bad spot already. Um, but those losses over time, the economy may improve. Um, we've got the situation where the, the business may be able to do different things. It may be able to turn this business around to some extent. So from that point of view, we've discounted the level of losses going forward at 25%, indicating that the, in future, the actual future losses may not be full losses. So you can see in each of these years, the first year comes to $196,000. By the end of the lease, we're looking at below $41,000. Um, that's for the present value of that loss in <laughs> eight years' time or so. So based on this approach, we've come up with a net present value of the future losses of $830,000. So that's what that's representing is that's the present value of the future funding that this business is going to need. Now, at the end of that lease, you'll terminate. If it's still making losses, you'll terminate the lease. No one's going to, wouldn't have thought someone's going to buy it. So we go back just slightly to the um, uh, assets that are there. And probably by the end of the lease, you're going to have to face a decision as to will I renew? I'll probably have to do a new fit out at that stage because it'll be a 10 year old fit out by that stage. It'll be getting a bit old and tired. Um, and if you're still making losses, I would think, yeah, wouldn't be too many business owners who would go again. Yeah. That being the case, if you shut your business down, um, we've got the, the work at the bottom, the franchise purchase amount of $50,000, that's gone. Equipment fit out, it's likely that that's going to be completely gone. On top of that, you'd like to have a make good on the premises, so there's amount you'll have to outlay. Mm. The stock, you'll probably get face value for stock, maybe if you've got somewhere else to, to use it, you'll keep that to a minimum if you're closing down. And the cash and rental bond, you presumably you get back. Um, so of the investment of $610,000, we need to fund in excess of $800,000 in present value of future funding. Um, and at the end of that, we're gonna get minimal back. So can a business have negative value? From our point of view, in this type of scenario, which is at the moment extremely common, um, yes, a business can have negative value. And probably the alternative here is, you know, if the landlord will, <coughs> pardon me, um, entertain the thought of you breaking your lease, you're probably still going to have to pay six to twelve months worth of rent. I would have thought to get out of your lease. And John just went through all those assets, and, and the scenario would probably not be that much different in terms of um, part of the deal you do with the landlord will be he'll keep the bond. 
Um, your stock, that's pretty minimal anyway. Your fit out, if you take that out, you might get a little bit for some ovens or something like that, but realistically the cost of pulling them out and the cost of the make good would probably go close to seeing each other out and the franchise purchase is is nothing. So probably if you can do a deal with the landlord, you're probably looking at you know six to 12 months worth of trading losses plus um, not much then at the end of the six or 12 months. So even if you can do a deal with the landlord in this scenario, you're probably still looking at a negative value as well. Nowhere near as bad as having to keep trading it for eight years because your landlord won't let you break your lease, um, but still a negative value. But I would say with someone like Townsville at the moment, um, that six to 12 months um, negotiation is usually the time period that the landlord estimates it's going to take to release the, um, the premises. In Townsville, there's vacancies everywhere. Um, so the, the landlord may not be that willing to actually step forward and say, sure, um, pay 12 months and, and I'll find another tenant because they may not find another tenant for a very long period of time. I mean, I also did a recent one of a, a restaurant bar that wasn't trading very well. It had sort of gone down and needed a bit of life into it. They ended up selling it for $1 and the new tenant, you know, renegotiated the lease with the landlord. And the landlord had actually, he just wanted to keep a tenant in there. And our client had said, well, no, I don't, I don't want to keep trading it. I've got the option to, to walk out at the end because my lease is just a bit up. And the landlord said, I'll give you the last 12 months of your lease for free. And um, if you can find me another tenant. So best, you know, their scenario was they got $1 for their business. Um, as Peter and I always do, we start chatting about things we're passionate about and we've just realised we're halfway through this webinar and we're just on the first point. Um, look, secondly, the other thing I just want to quickly raise, um, on the right-hand side of your screen, you should have, um, if you have any questions on the way through, please type a question. I can see those questions pop up here. Um, the next one we'll quickly talk about is, is, a business, is the business structure a valuable asset or a sunk cost? Um, now, we all have the situations where we move into premises, we fit those premises out, we spend a certain amount of money, um, if we if we move to another premises and leave that premises, what's that um, fit out worth? What it allows us quite often is the ability to derive an income, but it's not a saleable asset. Um, so that income that, that is there really is representative of the cash flows and therefore the value of that structure. Look at the infrastructure of a of a um, how it's actually accounted for. If we look at book value. Book value reflects cost or written down value of cost based on tax office amount. It does not represent market value. Um, if coincidentally it is the right amount, it is coincidence. Um, book value should always be used for level of caution. Market value, we need to look at what basis market value is. You know, if we look at, um, to fit out a premises, it might be half a million dollars. Um, if we spend half a million dollars, is it worth half a million dollars at that point? Was it worth something that's less? And um, what's it cost to, we're a couple of years in, what's it cost to replace something? We've got a lot of different market values that might be there. We send it to the auction. And um, if we go to insure it, what's the value? Um, if we actually go to realise it and it's liquidated, what's the value at that point? And I'm not talking just about fit outs, I'm talking about any type of, of asset. So we're looking at um, business premises fit out. Um, if you actually own the business, the actual um, building itself, it potentially has a different value to you than if you're actually leasing it because you actually own that fit out, you actually control what's happening to it after you finish, if you move out. And um, if it's specialised equipment, there may not be, and that's the example we have to walk through, there may not be a ready market for what's there. So specialised um, equipment, you may need to pay a certain amount to get in, but you may not have a ready market afterwards. R&D costs, um, we develop software, we develop a process, we develop a piece of machinery. It costs a certain amount. Can you turn around and sell that? Um, for example, it will also be websites. You know, we're constantly looking at revamping our website and we seems to be this bottomless hole. We, we put money and we revamp and we sort of go, oh, geez, we want to change it again. Um, is that value or is that just something that actually has been expended along the way and shouldn't actually really be, from a commercial viewpoint, reflected at that sort of value on the balance sheet? A quick look at a, and I will trace through this given the time, um, look at another case study. So in this case here, um, it was an automated manufacturing um, factory, which was a fascinating business to go and see. It had been operating for about five years. Um, it spent 
um, you know, two lines, we'll just look at one of those lines. It had spent, I think, um, $5 million um, buying and setting up this automated line. Um, so it was about three and a half million of this brand new automated line, which required no humans on the actual production line. Um, it literally, you, it, the, the plastic went in one end and the finished product came out on the other end on a pallet fully wrapped with all the other products that it was producing. It was quite phenomenal. Um, it's, it's had strong sales growth and that sales growth has continued to uh, into the future. Um, the contracts we are picking up were fantastic. It's had historical losses, but is now profitable. Um, and the forecast um, result is strong. But it also had uh, relatively low margins, so it was a, a high volume business that needed you know, to justify the, the amount spent on this automated line. Mm -hmm. um, but for you know the $5 million line, three and a half was the actual acquisition of the, the plant, and then there was a million and a half to set it up. So if you take it out, out of the place, where's that million and a half? But just quickly looking at the determination of the future maintainable earnings, obviously this is a cut down version, um, but you can see the trading performance, what was there. We can see our net sales have gone from 8.8 after discounts to 28.5 million after discounts. Our gross profit on the way through had successfully increased as they got more efficiencies within their line. Um, our costs have increased along with our sales, um, but our profitability is the important part has gone from a loss of $25 million, um, $25,000 up to profits. But the profits have dropped in more recent years that they've actually taken more things on board. Um, so we can see that our, sorry, uh, we can see that our, um, our profitability is sitting at about 2.9 million in our maintainable earnings. Look at the assets that are here. Um, you can look through those in your own time, but we've really got a negative position of $14,000 on the actual balance sheet, um, which has improved over time as profits have been derived. Um, we've then split that balance sheet between core business assets and non-core business assets and putting in the financing in the non-core business assets. Um, so our core assets have gone um, are 11 and a half million with the balance being surplus, which is predominantly financing. We actually had a value of the business. We had $2.9 million for maintained learnings on an EBITDA basis. We used a cap rate of 30% given the risks that were associated at that point and coming up with an enterprise value of $9.7 million. But the assets employed were almost $12 million, which means there was a deficiency of $2 million um, when compared to capitalised value net assets. So that traditional approach that we apply that the, um, the value is the higher of the capitalised value of net assets. In this case here, the capitalised the capitalised value is just under ten. The act, the core assets are twelve. Therefore, what value do we have? Um, the long and the short of it in this case here is we took the capitalised value of ten million dollars as being the value of the business inclusive of all of the assets and liabilities, the core assets and liabilities employed in the business. And the rationale behind that was that the, the monies that actually expand, and this one here we have put both production lines in, but the monies that actually invested in the production line, they could never retrieve. Anyone coming in was actually looking at this as an income stream um, and what they could do with that income stream. They couldn't actually turn around and sell the equipment. For the eleven point eight million dollars that was the value sitting on the balance sheet, so if they tried, you know, of each of those lines, so two lines at five million dollars cost, three million gets wiped away straight away. That's the setup cost. We need the cost of actually um, dismantling them. You take the used equipment down at the auction yard. If you've got a couple of million bucks for that, you're probably doing extremely well. Um, so from that point of view, the actual investment in the infrastructure was a sunk cost. The value of this was the capitalised um, income stream which is going back to, again, the uh, definition of market value is the present value of the future income streams. That falls squarely within that. So we'll just wind up now with um, just a recap on the three primary drivers of valuation. So those three drivers are profitability, risk, and working capital. So we've already, you know, a couple of those examples, we've spoken about profitability, but um, what are the, the key things when you're looking at profitability in terms of 
the primary drivers. And again, we just take you back to that definition. Um, it's the present value of the future income streams given the risks associated with the business. In this case here, future income streams are your profitability. The risks associated with the business, your capitalisation rate, is exactly that. And then what do you actually need to use in the business? That's your infrastructure, your working capital. So the main things to um, remember when you're looking at profitability, it's future maintainable earnings. It's all about the future, not the past. Now, you, know, you might have seen business valuations where people just take the last three years and average that. Um, that's fine if, if that's the valuer's honest opinion of what the future is likely to hold. Um, in our restaurant example, well, we uh, did a discounted cash flow there, assuming that the 2016 result, the, the loss of about 200,000 was likely to be the future trading performance. So it's not as simple as just looking at the past and saying, that's what will happen in the future. You need to consider things you know, for known events. The past is always just a proxy. It gives you a bit of a guide. Um, no one's got a beautiful crystal ball that will tell us exactly what's going to happen in the future. So there's going to be some assumptions um, built into this for sure. But um, you can you know, just do the best you can with what you've got, I suppose. So. The other thing to remember is when you're looking at profitability, it's important to, when you're looking at a profit and loss statement historically, and remember, does this represent the business, the core business? Uh, this is dot point three here. So we only want to look at what are the core business items. You may have a trust operating the business, for example, and in its profit and loss statement, it has sales, purchases, all the expenses, uh, to do with running the business, but then it also has you know, rent received from another property that's totally unrelated to the business. So that needs to be excluded when you're looking at the, um, the true trading performance of the business. Fourth point, exclude non-recurring items. So you're looking at the future and you're saying, well, this thing might have happened in the past, but it's not going to happen in the future, so we exclude that. And the last one, and the most common when you're looking at small, medium enterprises is you're looking at trying to work out what the true profitability of the business is. So this is after the owner has taken a commercial salary. So you're really looking at it from the point of view of the investor and you're saying, so in this case, you know, most small businesses, the owner is the investor being the shareholder. So he needs to, when he's looking at the true performance of his business, he needs to say, right, well, if I got a, a real salary package for what I do, what, how much profit is this thing really making? So if, normally for tax planning purposes, you normally find owners' salaries are you know, below what they're worth out in the marketplace, leaving more profit in the entity that runs the business to then be distributed in the most tax effective manner. Just touch on that um, second point again, the allow for non, non events, as we said before, you know, using your past as a proxy to the future, but it is all about the future. And the other thing is that quite often, particularly what we're seeing at the moment, consistency in businesses today has changed dramatically to where it was prior to the GFC. Um, we look at businesses now and it is so important to actually get hold of monthly trading positions to see what trends are actually happening in the business. Are the clients recurring? Are the clients going to be there? Have we got new clients or we lost clients? Um, anything that we've known as at the date of valuation should be reflected either in the actual earnings if we can quantify it or the risk if we can't quantify it. I'm not saying we should actually do um, retrospective valuations, but if information is known at the time, that should be reflected in the valuation. So our second driver is risk. And important to remember here, it's not just the risk, it's also the opportunity. So um, if this is a business that yeah, has a lot of opportunities and a lot of growth potential, um, that's obviously a business that's more attractive than a business that's in an industry, second point, that's on the decline. So, you know, if you own the only remaining video rental store in Brisbane, obviously there's not a lot of um, opportunity for growth in such a business. I think it just closed. Oh, did it? Okay. There's still one at Landsborough if you're looking for it. The, um, whereas if you've got other businesses that are, you know, new and um, growing, very well, obviously that's a more preferable investment opportunity for, for an investor. Um, also looking at when you're looking at risk, 
you know, what is the type and diversification of work? So is it a is it a sort of business that just relies on one particular stream of of service it provides, or has it got a diversified sort of service offering? Um, things like staff retention, that's also very important. So if you've got key staff who have been there a long time and know all the clients and know the, the processes and the industry and the technology involved in whatever you're selling, um, that's a business in some ways, if you can retain those staff, it lowers your risk. But if there's a risk of those people leaving, that increases the overall business risk. Things like the spread, nature, and loyalty of clients. So if you've got you know one client making up 90% of your, your turnover, your business is obviously a lot more risky than someone who's got 20 clients each contributing about 5% of the turnover. If you lost one of your 20, well, you probably survive. If you lost your Mr. 90%, um, you'd have to question whether you even have an, an ongoing viable business. And that's actually, um, we often get asked, how do you work out capitalization rates? How do you work... Um, what the actual risk profile is. Well, quite often, part of that analysis, and it's only part of it, part of that analysis is doing some form of sensitivity analysis. So exactly what you just said, if we had 20 customers that all had about 5% of the business, what would happen to the business profitability if we lost one client? So we actually reduce those sales, reduce the actual variable expenses. What's the actual change in the profitability? What if we have one that's 50% and we lost that client? What's the effect on the business going to have? So from that point of view, you're, you're looking at measures to actually try to quantify risk. Um, next is you know, the stability of the customers and suppliers. So if you've had customers who have been here for a long time, the expectation is they'll continue, then that's less risky than obviously if you, you know, you've got a lot of volatility in your customers and you never know where your next sale is coming from. Um, and people tend to concentrate a lot on customers, but it's also suppliers. So... How good is your supply chain? If you rely on one or two key suppliers, what happens if you lose them? You might have the exclusive rights to import um, tapware into Australia. What you, know, you have done for the last 20 years and you've made a very good living out of it, but that supplier agreement is due to expire in three months' time. What happens if you lose that? You probably haven't got a business. We, we had that example. We? Yes. We had one that I think was, they had sales about $42 million of a particular product. Um, and that um, supplier decided to actually go to a bigger organisation, had a bigger network, and we lost the, the um, agreement to supply. It represented overnight about $20 million in sales. Um, but the problem also with that is we also carried about $5 million worth of this stock. And without being able to market it with everything else that we do, suddenly that stock was worthless. So it had a double whammy on the business value. And I think in that example also, because the... That, that one product or one uh, manufacturer represented about half of their sales, but people often only bought other stuff from us because they were already putting that stuff in the order. So it wasn't just losing the 20 million, we were probably going to lose another 5 million of, of other stuff as well. Um, systems and controls, I think I've already mentioned, you know, if you've got a business that, that is well systematised or is it just all in the owner's head, um, more risky on the second scenario, with, with that one, I just use the example of um, a mechanics business. I, I swear in all my years of valuations, this has held true with every single mechanics business. Don't look at the actual financial statements. Walk into a mechanics business. If they, you actually walk up to the desk and it's orderly with everything's in its spot, or you actually walk up and there's grease everywhere, there's, there's all the receipts sitting on a spike, um, there's open books around the place, it's messy. Um, you go out to the back area, is everything orderly, there's a spot for each car, everything's in its, you can see how they've actually got the racking system, all the tools are nicely put away, it's clean, or is everything sitting everywhere and there's grease on the ground? Every single time I've been there, the one that's messy, bad systems, has not been overly profitable. The one that's got the good systems has been overly profitable. And you can easily walk around and see what spares they've got, um, Everything just flows in the, in the good systems business and value has followed. And the last point there, investment into the future. So if you've got a business that yeah, is in, in a rapidly evolving sort of industry that needs to constantly reinvent itself and, and spend money on, on technology, that's obviously more risk than a business that is, is pretty all well set it and so steady she goes. Okay, so our last primary driver is working capital. So the important thing to remember here is working capital will affect the level of goodwill, not the business value. So 
um, you might remember in that example earlier, we you know, we had earnings divided by the capitalization rate gives us a total business value. We then deduct from that the business assets. So in our manufacturing plant example, we had um, earnings divided by capitalization rate came to about $10 million, but our working capital at cost was about $12 million, in which case we had no goodwill. But if that working capital had only been, say, $5 million, we would have ended up with $5 million worth of goodwill. So the level of working capital directly affects the level of goodwill. Um, so most commonly working capital is things such as debtors, working progress, stock as well, creditors. I mean, some businesses only have stock. A lot of retail type businesses don't have debtors because everything's paid in cash. Um, you've got a stock holding and you may have some creditors. So at the end of the day, prima facie, the greater the level of working capital required, the lower the level of goodwill. But also that's one of our risk factors, probably in primary driver number two, if you've got a business that does have a lot of tangible assets behind it, um, that can be realized for close to their, their cost value, then that's probably a lower risk. Um, if the business does turn sour, at least you can exit the business and still get um, realized some value from it by selling off that stock or collecting your debtors or whatever it might be, as opposed to the sort of business that um, a services type business that doesn't have a lot. Um, it's very profitable, but doesn't require a lot of working capital. If the profitability drops off though, it just goes straight to the, um, the value of goodwill and you can't sell off that lost goodwill anywhere. You can't recoup any of if, what you paid for it. So not mind blowing stuff. The business drivers are profitability, risk, working capital, increase your profit, decrease your risk, and um, decrease your working capital. Therefore, you're getting a higher return on the level of working capital you've got within the business. Um, so that just about brings us to an end of um, the valuation things. And as um, John said at the start, we're both directors in forensic services. So what we uh, work on, in, as well as business valuations, a lot of the business valuations we do are used for insurance matters, commercial disputes, uh, family, um, family law matters, estate matters, forensic technology, fraud investigations, financial crime investigations, and um, not just in litigation, but also in alternative dispute resolution type things. Which we tend to be doing a lot more work in relation to succession planning within businesses um, and essentially tax planning and, and, and restructuring that way to actually do the valuations for external parties. But um, that draws to a close what we had to talk to you about today. Um, if you have any questions, um, you've got our our contact details in front of the slides that we'll get sent through shortly or send them through to Jess who um, I believe you've been emailing with already. Um, happy to answer any questions. So thank you very much.